Welcome to Craftlit, the podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 532, Judge Not. This episode of Craftlet is brought to you by you. Thank you. Well, hello. How are you? I am well. I am a working girl. I have learned so much about crisis management and COVID-19 and communication and psychological first aid, and I am tired. (laughs) Not tired of learning things. As you well know, it's my jam, but tired nonetheless. So I haven't collected a whole lot for you for this week, but I am I am collecting things. I just haven't compiled them in a way that makes it useful for me to give them to you yet. That being said, we do have one chapter today, chapter 30. It's a pivotal chapter, and I don't want to waste any time getting you into it. There's only one word you need to, well, you don't even need. It's just, it makes it not rear its head and make you go, Arr? So the word is gulf. Emily and Anne Bronte used the word gulf the way that Milton used the word abyss. The abyss. If you go to hell, you plummet into the abyss. Gulf means the same thing to Anne. So when it pops up, that's what she's talking about. Now, last week was our our set of chapters of bad behavior. This week, our behavior is not so bad, which means that we have some time to reflect on the bad behavior and and kind of take a breath and get a moment to think about moving forward. And, and some interesting things come out that I am not going to preset for you. I am going to let y'all listen, and then we'll, uh, we'll talk about it on the flip side. All right. I hope that's good with you. I will talk to you after you listen to Chapter 30 of The Tenant of Wildfell Hall by Anne Bronte, read for you by Maya Degere. Here we go. Chapter 30, Domestic Scenes. On the following morning, I received a few lines from him myself, confirming Hargrave's intimations respecting his approaching return. And he did come next week, but in a condition of body and mind even worse than before. I did not, however, intend to pass over his derelictions this time without a remark. I found it would not do. But on the first day, he was weary with his journey, and I was glad to get him back. I would not upbraid him then. I would wait till tomorrow. Next morning, he was weary still. I would wait a little longer. But at dinner, when after breakfasting at twelve o'clock on a bottle of soda water and a cup of strong coffee, and lunching at two on another bottle of soda water, mingled with brandy, he was finding fault with everything on the table, and declaring we must change our cook. I thought the time was come. "'Tis the same cook as we had before you went, Arthur,' said I. "'You were generally pretty well satisfied with her then. "'You must have been letting her get into slovenly habits then while I was away. "'It's enough to poison one, eating such a disgusting mess.' "'And he pettishly pushed away his plate and leant back despairingly in his chair. "'I think it is you that are changed, not she,' said I, "'but with utmost gentleness, for I did not wish to irritate him. "'It may be so,' he replied carelessly, "'as he seized a tumbler of wine and water,' adding when he had tossed it off, for I have an infernal fire in my veins and all the waters of the ocean cannot quench. What kindled it? I was about to ask, but at that moment the butler entered and began to take away the things. Be quick, Benson, and have done with that infernal clatter, cried his master, and don't bring the cheese unless you want to make me sick outright. Benson, in some surprise, removed the cheese and did his best to effect a quiet and speedy clearance of the rest. 
but unfortunately there was a rumple in the carpet caused by the hasty pushing back of his master's chair at which he tripped and stumbled causing a rather alarming concussion with a tray full of crockery in his hands but no positive damage save the fall and breaking of a sauce tureen but to my unspeakable shame and dismay arthur turned furiously around upon him and swore at him with savage coarseness the poor man turned pale and visibly trembled as he stooped to pick up the fragments. "'He couldn't help it, Arthur,' said I. "'The carpet caught his foot and there's no great harm done. "'Never mind the pieces now, Benson. You can clear them away afterwards.' Glad to be released, Benson expeditiously set out the dessert and withdrew. "'What could you mean, Helen, by taking a servant's part against me?' said Arthur as soon as the door was closed. "'When you knew I was distracted.' I did not know you were distracted, Arthur, and the poor man was quite frightened and hurt at your sudden explosion. Poor man, indeed. And do you think I could stop to consider the feelings of an insensate brute like that when my own nerves were racked and torn to pieces by his confounded blunders? I never heard you complain of your nerves before. And why shouldn't I have nerves as well as you? Oh, I don't dispute your claim to their possession, but I never complain of mine. No, how should you when you never do anything to try them? Then why do you try yours, Arthur? Do you think I have nothing to do but stay at home and take care of myself like a woman? Is it impossible then to take care of yourself like a man when you go abroad? You told me you could, and would too, and you promised. Come, come, Helen, don't begin with that nonsense now. I can't bear it. Can't bear what? To be reminded of the promises you've broken. Helen, you're cruel. If you knew how my heart throbbed and how every nerve thrilled through me while you spoke, you would spare me. You can pity a dolt of a servant for breaking a dish, but you have no compassion for me when my head is split in two and all on fire with this consuming fever. He leant his head on his hand and sighed. I went to him and put my hand on his forehead. It was burning indeed. Then come with me into the drawing room, Arthur, and don't take any more wine. You've taken several glasses since dinner and eaten next to nothing all day. How can that make you better? With some coaxing and persuasion, I got him to leave the table. When the baby was brought, I tried to amuse him with that, but poor little Arthur was cutting his teeth and his father could not bear his complaints. A sentence of immediate banishment was passed upon him on the first indication of fretfulness, and because in the course of the evening I went to share his exile for a little while, I was reproached on my return for preferring my child to my husband. I found the latter reclining on the sofa just as I had left him. Well, exclaimed the injured man in a tone of pseudo-resignation, I thought I wouldn't send for you. I thought I'd just see how long it would please you to leave me alone. I've not been very long, have I, Arthur? I've not been an hour, I'm sure. Oh, of course, an hour is nothing to you, so pleasantly employed. But to me, it has not been pleasantly employed, interrupted I. I've been nursing our poor little baby, who is very far from well, and I could not leave him till I got him to sleep. Oh, to be sure, you're overflowing with kindness and pity for everything but me. And why should I pity you? What is the matter with you? Well, that passes everything. After all the wear and tear I've had, when I come home sick and weary, longing for comfort and expecting to find attention and kindness, at least from my wife, she calmly asks, what is the matter with me? There is nothing the matter with you, returned I, except what you have willfully brought upon yourself against my earnest exhortation and entreaty. Now, Helen, said he, emphatically half rising from his recumbent posture, if you bother me with another word, I'll ring the bell and order six bottles of wine, and by heaven I'll drink them dry before I stir from this place. I said no more, but sat down before the table and drew a book towards me. Do let me have quietness at least, continued he, if you deny me every other comfort, and sinking back into his former position with an impatient expiration between a sigh and a groan, he languidly closed his eyes as if to sleep. What the book was that lay open on the table before me I cannot tell, for I never looked at it. With an elbow on each side of it and my hands clasped before my eyes, I delivered myself up to silent weeping. But Arthur was not asleep. At the first slight sob, he raised his head and looked round, impatiently exclaiming, What are you crying for, Helen? What the deuce is the matter now? I'm crying for you, Arthur. 
I replied, speedily drying my tears and starting up. I threw myself on my knees before him and, clasping his nerveless hand between my own, continued, Don't you know that you are part of myself? And do you think you can injure and degrade yourself and I not feel it? Degrade myself, Helen? Yes, degrade. What have you been doing all this time? You'd better not ask, said he with a faint smile. And you had better not tell, but you can't deny that you have degraded yourself miserably. You have shamefully wronged yourself, body and soul, and me too. And I can't endure it quietly. And I won't. Well, don't squeeze my hand so frenetically and don't agitate me so for heaven's sake. Oh, Hattersley, you are right. This woman will be the death of me with her keen feelings and her interesting force of character. There, there, do spare me a little. Arthur, you must repent cried I, in a frenzy of desperation, throwing my arms around him and burying my face in his bosom. You shall say you are sorry for what you've done. Well, well, I am. You're not. You'll do it again. I shall never live to do it again if you treat me so savagely, replied he, pushing me from him. You've nearly squeezed the breath out of my body. He pressed his hand to his heart and looked really agitated and ill. Now get me a glass of wine, said he, to remedy what you've done, you she-tiger. I'm almost ready to faint. I flew to get the required remedy. It seemed to revive him considerably. What a shame it is, said I, as I took the empty glass from his hand, for a strong young man like you to reduce yourself to such a state. If you knew all, my girl, you'd say, rather, what a wonder it is you can bear it so well as you do. I've lived more in these four months, Helen, than you have in the whole course of your existence, or will to the end of your days if they numbered a hundred years. So I must expect to pay for it in some shape. You will have to pay a higher price than you anticipate if you don't take care. There will be the total loss of your own health, and of my affection too, if that is of any value to you. What, are you at that game of threatening me with the loss of your affection again, are you? I think it couldn't have been very genuine stuff to begin with if it's so easily demolished. If you don't mind, my pretty tyrant, you'll make me regret my choice in good earnest and envy my friend Hattersley, his meek little wife. She is quite a pattern to her sex, Helen. He had her with him in London all the season, and she was no trouble at all. He might amuse himself just as he pleased in regular bachelor style and she never complained of neglect. He might come home at any hour of the night or morning or not come home at all, be sullen, sober or glorious drunk and play the fool or the madman to his own heart's desire without any fear of botheration. She never gives him a word of reproach or complaint, do what he will. He says there's not such a jewel in all England and swears he wouldn't take a kingdom for her. But he makes her life a curse to her. Not he, she has no will but his and is always contented and happy as long as he's enjoying himself. In that case, she is as great a fool as he is. But it is not so. I've had several letters from her expressing the greatest anxiety about his proceedings, complaining that you incite him to commit those extravagances, one especially, in which she implores me to use my influence with you to get you away from London, and affirms that her husband never did such things before you came, and would certainly discontinue them as soon as you departed and left him the guidance of his own good sense. The detestable little traitor. Give me the letter and he shall see it as sure as I am a living man. No, he shall not see it without her consent. But if he did, there's nothing there to anger him, nor in any of the others. She never speaks a word against him. It is only anxiety for him that she expresses. She only alludes to his conduct in the most delicate terms and makes every excuse for him that she can possibly think of. And as for her own misery, I rather feel it that see it expressed in her letters. But she abuses me, and no doubt you helped her. No, I told her she overrated my influence with you, that I would gladly draw you away from the temptations of the town if I could, but had little hope of success, and that I thought she was wrong in supposing that you entice Mr Hattersley, or anyone else, into error. I had myself held the contrary opinion at one time, but now I believe that you mutually corrupted each other, and perhaps if she used a little gentle but serious remonstrance with her husband, it might be of some service. As though he was more rough-hewn than mine, I believed he was of a less impenetrable material. And so that is the way you go, heartening each other up to mutiny, and abusing each other's partners, and throwing out implications against your own to the mutual gratification of both. 
according to your own account, said I, my evil counsel has but little effect on her, and as to abuse and aspersions, we are both of us far too deeply ashamed of the errors and vices of our other halves to make them the common subject of our correspondence. Friends as we are, we would willingly keep your failings to ourselves, even from ourselves if we could, unless by knowing them we could deliver you from them. Well, well, don't worry me about them. You'll never affect any good by that. Have patience with me and bear with my languor and crossness a little while till I get this cursed low fever out of my veins, and then you'll find me cheerful and kind as ever. Why can't you be gentle and good as you were last time? I'm sure I was very grateful for it. And what good did your gratitude do? I deluded myself with the idea that you were ashamed of your transgressions and hoped you'd never repeat them again. But now you've left me nothing to hope. My case is quite desperate, is it? A very blessed consideration if it will only secure me from pain and worry of my dear anxious wife's efforts to convert me and her from the toil and trouble of such exertions and her sweet face and silver accents from the ruinous effects of the same. A burst of passion is a fine rousing thing upon occasion, Helen, and a flood of tears is marvellously affecting. But when indulged too often, they're both deuce plaguey things for spoiling one's beauty and tiring out one's friends. Thenceforth I restrained my tears and passions as much as I could. I spared him my exhortations and fruitless efforts at conversion too, for I saw it was all in vain. God might awaken that heart supine and stupefied with self-indulgence and remove the film of sensuous darkness from his eyes, but I could not. His injustice and ill-humour towards his inferiors who could not defend themselves I still resented and withstood, but when I alone was their object, as was frequently the case, I endured it with calm forbearance, except at times when my temper, worn out by repeated annoyances, or stung to distraction by some new instance of irrationality, gave way in spite of myself, and exposed me to the imputations of fierceness, cruelty and impatience. I attended carefully to his wants and amusements, but not, I own, with the same devoted fondness as before, because I could not feel it. Besides, I now had another claimant on my time and care, my ailing infant, for whose sake I frequently braved and suffered the reproaches and complaints of his unreasonably exacting father. But Arthur is not a naturally peevish or irritable man, so far from it, that there was something almost ludicrous in the incongruity of this adventitious fretfulness and nervous irritability, rather calculated to excite laughter than anger, if it were not for the intensely painful considerations attendant upon those symptoms of a disordered frame, and his temper gradually improved as his bodily health was restored, which was much sooner than would have been the case but for my strenuous exertions. For there was still one thing about him that I did not give up in despair, and one effort for his preservation that I would not remit. His appetite for the stimulus of wine had increased upon him, as I had too well foreseen, it was now something more to him than an accessory to social enjoyment. It was an important source of enjoyment in itself. In this time of weakness and desperation, he would have made it his medicine and support, his comforter, his recreation and his friend, and thereby sunk deeper and deeper, and bound himself down forever in the bathos wherein he had fallen. But I determined that this should never be as long as I had any influence left and though I could not prevent him from taking more than was good for him, still, by incessant perseverance, by kindness, firmness and vigilance, by coaxing and daring and determination, I succeeded in preserving him from his absolute bondage to that detestable propensity, so insidious in its advances, so inexorable in its tyranny, so disastrous in its effects. And here I must not forget that I am not a little indebted to his friend, Mr Hargrave, about that time he frequently called at Grassdale and often dined with us, on which occasions I fear Arthur would willingly have cast prudence and decorum to the winds and made a night of it, as often as his friend would have consented to join him in that exalted pastime, and if the latter had chosen to comply, he might, in a night or two, have ruined the labour of weeks and overthrown with a touch the frail bulwark that had cost me such trouble and toil to construct. 
I was so fearful of this at first that I humbled myself to intimate to him in private my apprehensions of Arthur's proneness to these excesses and to express a hope that he would not encourage it. He was pleased with his mark of confidence and certainly did not betray it. On that and every subsequent occasion, his presence served rather as a check upon his host than an incitement to further acts of intemperance and he always succeeded in bringing him from the dining room in good time and tolerably good condition. For if Arthur disregarded such intimations as, well, I must not detain you from your lady, or we must not forget that Mrs Huntington is alone, he would insist upon leaving the table himself to join me, and his host, however unwillingly, was obliged to follow. Hence I learned to welcome Mr Hargrave as a real friend to the family, a harmless companion for Arthur, to cheer his spirits and preserve him from the tedium of absolute idleness and total isolation from all society but mine, and a useful ally to me. I could not but feel grateful to him under such circumstances, and I did not scruple to acknowledge my obligation on the first convenient opportunity. Yet, as I did so, my heart whispered all was not right, and brought a glow to my face which he heightened by his steady, serious gaze, while by his manner of receiving those acknowledgments, he more than doubled my misgivings. His high delight at being able to serve me was chastened by sympathy for me and commiseration for himself about I do not know what, for I would not stay to inquire or suffer him to unburden his sorrows to me. His sighs and intimations of suppressed affliction seemed to come from a full heart, but either he must contrive to retain them within it or breathe them forth in other ears than mine. There was enough of confidence between us already. It seemed wrong that there should exist a secret understanding between my husband's friend and me, unknown to him, of which he was the object. But my afterthought was, if it is wrong, surely Arthur's is the fault, not mine. And indeed, I know not whether at the time it was not for him rather than myself that I blushed. For since he and I are one, I so identify myself with him that I feel his degradation, his failings and transgressions as my own. I blush for him. I fear for him, I repent for him, weep, pray and feel for him as for myself, but I cannot act for him, and hence I must be, and am debased, contaminated by the union both in my own eyes and the actual truth. I am so determined to love him, so intensely anxious to excuse his errors, that I am continually dwelling upon them, and labouring to extenuate the loosest of his principles and the worst of his practices, till I am familiarised with vice and almost a partaker in his sins. The things that formerly shocked and disgusted me now seem only natural. I know them to be wrong because reason and God's word declared them to be so, but I am gradually losing that instinctive horror and repulsion which was given me by nature or instilled into me by the precepts and examples of my aunt. Perhaps then I was too severe in my judgments, for I abhorred the sinner as well as the sin, now I flatter myself I am more charitable and considerate, but am I not becoming more indifferent and insensate too? Fool that I was to dream that I had strength and purity enough to save myself and him. Such vain presumption would be rightly served if I should perish with him in the gulf from which I sought to save him. Yet God preserve me from it, and him too. Yes, poor Arthur, I will still hope and pray for you, and though I write as if you were some abandoned wretch, past hope and past reprieve, it is only my anxious fears, my strong desires that make me do so. One who loved you less would be less bitter, less dissatisfied. His conduct has of late been what the world calls irreproachable, but then I know his heart is still unchanged, and I know that spring is approaching, and deeply dread the consequences. As he began to recover the tone and vigour of his exhausted frame, and with it something of his former impatience of retirement and repose, I suggested a short residence by the seaside for his recreation and further restoration, and for the benefit of our little one as well. But no, watering places were so intolerably dull. Besides, he had been invited by one of his friends to spend a month or two in Scotland for the better recreation of grouse shooting and deer stalking, and had promised to go. "'Then you will leave me again, Arthur,' said I. "'Yes, dearest, but only to love you the better when I come back "'and make up for all past offences and shortcomings. "'And you needn't fear me this time. "'There are no temptations on the mountains. 
and during my absence you may pay a visit to Stanningley if you like. Your uncle and aunt have long been wanting us to go there, you know, but somehow there's such a repulsion between the good lady and me that I could never bring myself up to the scratch. I was perfectly willing to avail myself of this permission, though not a little apprehensive of my aunt's questions and comments concerning my matrimonial experience, regarding which I'd been very reserved in my letters, for I had not had much that was pleasant to communicate. About the third week in August, Arthur set out for Scotland, and Mr Hargrave accompanied him thither, to my private satisfaction. Shortly after, I, with little Arthur and Rachel, went to Stanningley, my dear old home, which, as well as my dear old friends, its inhabitants, I saw again with mingled feelings of pleasure and pain, so intimately blended that I could scarcely distinguish the one from the other, or tell to which attribute the various tears and smiles and sighs awakened by those old familiar scenes, tones and faces. Not quite two years had passed since I had seen and heard them last, but it seemed far, far longer time, and well it might, for how immensely changed was I! How many things had I or not seen and felt and learned since then! My uncle, too, appeared perceptibly more aged and infirm, my aunt more sad and grave, I believe she thought I had repented of my rashness, though she did not openly express her conviction or triumphantly remind me of her slighted counsels, as I had partly feared she would. But she observed me narrowly, more narrowly than I liked to be observed, and seemed to mistrust my cheerfulness and unduly mark each little indication of sadness or serious thought, to notice all my casual observations and silently draw her own inferences from them while by a system of quiet cross-questioning, renewed from time to time, she drew from me many things I should not otherwise have told her, and laying this and that together, obtained, I fear, a pretty clear conception of my husband's faults and my afflictions, though not of my remaining sources of comfort and hope, for though I endeavoured to impress her strongly with the notion of Arthur's redeeming qualities, of all our mutual affection, and the many causes I had for thankfulness and self-congratulation, she received all such intimations coldly and calmly, as if mentally making her own deductions, which deductions, I am persuaded, were generally far beyond the truth, though I certainly did exaggerate a little in attempting to picture the bright side of my position. Was it pride that made me so extremely anxious to appear satisfied with my lot, or merely just determination to bear my self-imposed burden alone and preserve my best friend from the slightest participation in those sorrows, from which she had striven so hard to save me. It might have been something of each, but I'm sure the latter motive was predominant. I did not much prolong my visit, for not only did I feel my aunt's restless watchfulness and incredulity to be a restraint upon me, and a silent reproach that oppressed me more than she could well imagine, but I was sensible that my little Arthur was an annoyance to his uncle, though the latter wished him well, and no great amusement to his aunt, though an object of her earnest affection and anxious solicitude. Dear aunt, have you so tenderly reared me from infancy, so carefully guided and instructed me into childhood and youth, and could I give you no return but this, to disappoint your hopes, oppose your wishes, scorn your warnings and advice, and darken your latter years with anxious fears and sorrow for the sufferings you cannot relieve? It almost broke my heart to think of it and again and again I endeavoured to convince her that I was happy and contented with my lot. But her last words as she embraced me and kissed the child in my arms before I entered the carriage were, Take care of your son, Helen. There may be happy days in store for you yet. How great a comfort and treasure he is to you now I can well imagine. But if you spoil him to gratify your present feelings, it will be too late to repent when your heart is broken. Arthur did not come home till several weeks after my return to Grassdale, but I did not feel so anxious about him now. To think of him engaged in active sports among the wild hills of Scotland was very different from knowing him to be immersed amid the corruptions and temptations of London. His letters now, though neither long nor lover-like, were more regular than ever they had been before, and when he did return, to my great joy, instead of being worse than when he went, it was more cheerful and vigorous, and better in every respect. Since that time, I have had little cause to complain. He still has an unfortunate predilection for the pleasures of the table, against which I had to struggle and watch, but he has begun to notice his boy, 
and that is an increasing source of amusement to him within doors, while his fox hunting and coursing are of sufficient occupation for him without, when the ground is not hardened by frost, so that he is not wholly dependent on me for entertainment. But it is now January, spring is approaching, and, I repeat, I dread the consequences of its arrival. That sweet season, once so joyously welcomed, as the time of hope and gladness, awakens now far other anticipations by its return. Right. So, the first, I think, big thing that Anne Bronte didn't belabor at all in this chapter is Helen went back to Stanningley. And her, her uncle is older and not quite as hale and hearty as he was previously, which is a thing, you know, what with life doing what it does to all of us eventually. And we get a chance to see Helen's aunt. This, to me, was actually one of those scenes, the, the first time I read through the book, this was one of those scenes that I had dreaded because I had a, a horrible feeling that her aunt was going to sit there with the raised eyebrow, nodding sagely and scornfully and saying, I told you so. And when that didn't actually happen, I mean, she, Helen is clear, her aunt is watching her. Her aunt knows this has not been a good and happy marriage. It's been a while since they've seen each other, for one thing. It's clear that her aunt knows plenty about what's probably been going on. But that, of course, isn't going to mean that she wouldn't want confirmation. She's She is not the kind of woman to go off half-cocked or necessarily make assumptions in any way that will influence how she loves or cares about Helen. And Helen's reading of the whole thing, I think, is is pretty insightful, not a surprise. Both thinking, oh my gosh, it was pride that got me in this situation, thinking that I knew better, and also the regret, especially now that she has her own child, uh, the regret that she feels for having taken this beautiful life that her aunt helped set up for her and kind of thumbing her nose at it and saying, I know better and I'm going to go off with this guy that everybody on the planet is warning me away from. And her aunt gives her a fairly cogent piece of advice. Yet again, don't spoil little Arthur. If he becomes your substitute husband, that's not going to be good for anybody. And I don't mean it in any kind of uh, untoward or nefarious or uh, deeply unpleasant kind of way. I just mean emotionally, if little Arthur is the only person she has to talk to along with Rachel, that makes everything really complicated for her at home. And if she indulges the child too much because her perception is that the rest of his life is misery anytime his father is around, that creates a whole different set of problems. As we know, we have seen lots of spoiled children in literature, probably not to mention real life as well. So the warning is well stated and appears to be heard by Helen. We also have Arthur coming home from Scotland, not in miserable shape. It's like there's hope. It's like it's possible for him to go off and have a good time and enjoy himself and yet return finding that he is still in one piece and copus mentis and not racked. And a, a comment on the utter rackedness of form, frame, and mind when he returns at the beginning of this chapter. I believe Anne Bronte's intention at this point is indeed to imply that this is more than just him going out and drinking himself stupid every night. I think because of what she saw happen with Branwell and other people, that she is well aware of what opiates can do to one's health. And I, I believe that his low-grade fever, his physical dissipation, his uh, the length of his convalescence. This is not a really bad hangover from a month of partying with wine. This is worse, and she knows it. 
Anne Bronte doesn't make a big deal of it. I think she's coding it so that if you know what she's hinting at, you'll pick up on it. Otherwise, you're just going to think, wow, he drank a lot. And, and she does give us this relatively happy ending to the chapter. Of course, it ends on the down note of her anticipating, of Helen anticipating that spring is coming and that will not be good for anyone named Arthur or Helen <laughs> or Rachel. But the the other important Anne Bronte-ism that's going on here is this concept of, of degradation. Uh, I don't know if you remember, if you if you listened to Wuthering Heights with us back in the day, almost 10 years ago, degradation, degrade, is a word that gets used a lot in Wuthering Heights. And this absolutely goes back to the kind of proto-Penny Dreadful magazines that the Bronte kids were reading, uh, full of melodrama and vice and, and, of course, virtuous virtue. We are starting to see the polarization of Helen and Arthur in this respect. And it's doing some really interesting things to Helen psychologically, something that makes it very hard for people on the outside of relationships like this to see and understand what's actually going on in the mind of the person who is most affected, which would be the the watcher, not the participant, the person who's watching the, in this case, and I'm using air quotes, degradation. This is because Anne Bronte is tapping into, well, no, I back up. <laughs> Sum up is too much. Arthur's debauchery, while plenty of fun for him, apparently, is no picnic to watch. However, when you have lived around, uh, I'm trying to figure out a way to say this that isn't just totally appalling. Okay, uh, I, here, I've got one. I left Tucson, Arizona. I went to UCLA. I am in the theater department. One of the things that happens in the theater department is you get really used to being around a lot of people in physical states that you wouldn't necessarily encounter when you were out in your, say, poli sci class. You are in various states of undress in the dressing room with people who you don't know, or at least are, you know, only tangentially used to, or have seen in a class at one point. But you wind up in a show with them, and you're sharing a dressing room, and you're doing makeup next to them. And if you're in a touring show, you are probably sharing bathrooms. And I mean, it's just... It's crazy the level of, I guess, physical intimacy that you get used to with people who are largely strangers. And it totally seems normal when you're in the middle of it because everybody else is doing it too. You can see this a little bit, as I recall, and I haven't seen it for a while, but I think if you go watch the, the movie version of Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead, excellent movie. I know we've talked about it before. I think I even played the tennis sequence for you before. If you go back and you watch Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead, I believe there is a sequence where the players are getting dressed and putting on their makeup and things like that. And there is this kind of casual intimacy between and amongst them. David Tennant's Hamlet, when the players show up, you also see that to a certain extent with them. Uh, as I recall, it's a lesser extent because, of course, Hamlet... Hamlet is more Hamlet than Rosencrantz and Guildenstern is Hamlet. So it's a little more formal. But it, it doesn't take a whole lot of time of, of being exposed to this other world that you would find yourself a really ridiculously modest 18-year-old female from Tucson, Arizona, finding yourself pretty much okay with all of this and all of the attendant weirdness that goes along with that, whether it's you're in a show where you play a character where you are cursing like a sailor or I was in a show where I had to smoke and I don't smoke and I've never smoked but I smoked and in order to play a smoker you have to get to a certain level of comfort with a cigarette or you look like you're faking it and it's really unpleasant to watch somebody who's clearly finding the whole process distasteful so there's a lot of stuff that you just kind of gradually get used to when you are surrounded by other people doing exactly the same thing. Here we have Helen, who is 
in one breath being pushed into being far more pious and judgy than she ever was when we saw her at the beginning of her diary. Something to remind you of. And we have Arthur, who is, we know, capable of being sober and charming and disarmingly charming and a bit of a rapscallion in a fun way, except we know that he's a Byronic hero and therefore dangerous when he's like that. But okay, we've, we've got these two people at the beginning of her diary who are probably not that good for each other, but if for whatever reason he was able to come closer to her in a moderate enjoyment of imbibing and doing things that he thought were pleasurable, it all could have worked. But instead, he keeps pulling her, trying to pull her farther towards being Annabella. But since she's been sober most of the time that he's been drunk or otherwise, she sees how pathetic they all look. And boy, are we going to see some examples of them being pathetic. It reminds me, I know my mom's been listening. I don't know if she'll remember this. When I was in sixth or seventh grade, there was a dinner party that I believe was held on our street. And this is right before we moved to Tucson. And I was asked to be a server. So, you know, I had to wear a nice dress and I basically, you know, serve from one side, remove from the other side, all of that stuff. This was the first time in my life that I remember seeing some adult person get drunk. And I, I seem to recall that I could tell something was going on. And I think it was actually the host. I mean, it was his wife's dinner party. It was probably a junior league thing or PEO. It couldn't have been PEO. Nobody in PEO would ever have done this. Uh, it must have been a junior league thing. And I think I picked up on his wife's discomfort first and then started to notice that he was getting louder and louder. And there were probably, I don't know, four or five round tables that they had set up in their living slash dining area. It was one of those big, open, like vaulted ceilings, late 1970s homes. Anyway, when it really became clear that something was up and different and off was when he had taken some flowers. I remember daisies. I have no idea if that's true. He had taken them out of the centerpieces and put them behind his ears and was singing the village people's macho man. And, and I remember seeing his wife tug at his sleeve and try to get him to sit down and shut up. And he wouldn't. And that was truly the first time I ever saw an adult person, not in a film, not on TV or in a play, behave like that. And it, it clearly made an impression on me. And like I said, I seriously doubt that either of my parents would remember this because it probably just was something you laughed at if you were the adult person in the room who had been around for a few more years than I had and had seen things. Now, was his wife drinking wine? Absolutely, she was drinking wine. Was she having a lovely time at the party? Absolutely, she was having a lovely time at the party. Had his behavior pushed her into a position where she felt ashamed for him and therefore felt the need to pull him back and get him to stop before he makes an ass of himself? Yes, absolutely. Was she always that kind of tight lipped and prim and restrictive and restrained? Probably not. She was lovely when we set everything up at the beginning of the party. I don't remember her as being a shrew or a difficult person or a party pooper or any of those things. But it's a, it's a microcosm of the larger recurring episode we see happening between Arthur and Helen. And it's the recurrence of it that is pushing Helen further and further into piety. And we're going to see more of that happen. And it now all, if you haven't already been thinking about it, and you probably have, makes Helen at the beginning of the book with Mrs. Markham make a whole lot more sense. She has already told us at the beginning of the book that she did something with little Arthur that Mrs. Markham was horrified by. And that was basically do a Pavlovian experiment on her son, where every time he had wine, had access to wine, she also gave him 
what was it, Ipecac, an emetive, something, something to make him sick at the same time, which is, it seems kind of extreme and horrible at the beginning of the book, right? I mean, wow, that's, that's taken the tolerance movement a step further than everybody else did. And yet, now she makes all sorts of sense. It's like a, a YouTuber who I was watching recently who is, uh, she has multiple disabilities, but they're all invisible disabilities, including that she is, she's deaf. She became deaf when she was 15. So she knew language. She knew how to speak. She's very clever, clearly. And so she can lip read quite well. And she can hear some if she has hearing aids in. She's not profoundly deaf where there's a, a neurological disconnect where she's not only not hearing well, but what she's hearing isn't speech that everybody else gets to hear. Anyway, I was watching her. I will put a link to this particular video in the show notes because I cannot for the life of me remember her name right now. But she's lovely and on Instagram. Her disabilities are quite invisible. Among her many disabilities, she has, and I'm not going to use the real terminology for it because she can say it very quickly. I cannot. If she stands up too fast, she faints. All of her joints are hyperextensive, so she can dislocate everything at will. She can dislo she dislocates her thumb on camera painlessly because she's done it so many times. Other parts of her body, when they get dislocated, like if she falls on the floor, it's not so painless. So she is also, not surprisingly, in constant pain. There are several other things that are going on concurrently with that that are uh, nerve damage issues. And therefore, she often, when she goes out in public, is either in a wheelchair or she's on one of the little motor scooters, which leads people, because she is gorgeous and apparently able-bodied, it leads people to make all sorts of judgy judgments about her. Which, of course, when I give you the precursor to that fact, we all naturally respond with, how could they be so awful? I mean, obviously, if she's in a wheelchair or if she's on a scooter and she's young and beautiful, there must be something really wrong with her. However, it turns out that there is a thing, capital T, that has been happening probably to people you know as well as people I do, where assumptions are made that people are faking disabilities in order to get sympathy, get extra, be treated better slash differently. I'm not sure. It's kind of like the gay thing. I'm not sure who would choose to be gay with all of the inherent dangers and difficulties that come along with that. I'm not sure who would choose to pretend to be disabled just to get a motorized scooter at a grocery store. I mean, I used one when I had pneumonia. It was the only way I could make it around. But then I was working on, you know, what, 40% lung capacity, 30% lung capacity. And oxygen, it turns out, is kind of important. So it was very easy to be judgy about Helen at the beginning of the book. We now have a much clearer picture of why she was the way she is in the beginning of the book. We haven't gotten to the end of that yet. And it's just going to get more and more clear as we go. And of course, the longer you live in a situation where you are being torqued like this, the more ingrained those behaviors come. I think it's pretty clear if you go back and listen again to the beginning chapters that Helen starts off very tight and compressed. And, and that's when she has her conversations with Mrs. Markham. But by the time she gives Gilbert her diary, which of course is a huge thing in and of itself, uh, she's lightened up a lot. We have seen her laugh. We have seen her make jokes. We have seen her still taking her work very seriously because for God's sake, it is her only source of income. And we've seen her taking her raising of Arthur very seriously. That doesn't mean she doesn't want the child to play. She's happy to let him have the dog. She enjoys watching him with Gilbert. Uh, we know that Anne Bronte for her, someone's treatment of animals and children is way more important than their treatment of other adults, which I think is why Gilbert, <laughs> Gilbert gets a 
sort of pass so far, we think, maybe, from her for his, his treatment of Mr. Lawrence. But the important thing here, and where I'm going to let it go, is this. The worse Arthur behaves, the more Helen feels it on a very personal level. And because she can't get him to stop, she has kind of a, it's like a survivor's guilt mixed with the, if only I could figure out how to help thing going on, which puts her in a position where now she's obsessing about it, even when he's not there, trying to come up with the right alchemical concoction of behavior that would get him to stop. And of course, it's it's impossible because it's not anything that she's doing to make him behave this way. Now, he's perfectly capable of blaming her. In fact, his discussion with her about Millicent and the the letter, the, oh, so you two are just constantly dissing me and my friends in your letters. Give me the letter. What does he, he calls her, Millicent, a detestable little traitor. And then he uses the phrase, and so that's the way you go on in these letters, heartening each other up to mutiny and abusing each other's partners and throwing out implications against your own to the mutual gratification of both. Now, this is a, a beautifully Orwellian moment because, of course, that's what he does. This is the, if you're a hammer, everything else looks like a nail. That movie Arrival, it was a, a beautiful moment talking about why we Americans were facing this alien race that seems completely peaceful and not interested in doing anything particularly bad, but but so alien and so foreign and has a different language and is completely not understandable at the time to the military people in the movie, which I know it's reductionist and all of that. They were bound to see a military stance from the alien life forms because that's what they're looking for. We have seen with uh, not just politics, but, but normal people in their political discussions the uh, assumption that there will be bad behavior, which to me always makes me think, well, well, does that mean that if you were in that position, you would be lying and, lying and cheating and stealing? Because when I look at those positions, I don't, I don't actually think that. Like I have, I have political points of view. I'm fairly confident that I could, if my job required it, work in as close to a nonpartisan way as I could, with the caveat that from time to time, it would probably be important for people to stop me and say, wait, did you know that you're seeing things from this point of view, whereas other people are seeing it from this point of view? It's one of the things I love about Julie Davis is Forgotten Classics. She's been marvelous for all of us over time at being able to say, no, you you understand part of the Catholic point of view on this one, but let me fill you in on the rest because you're still seeing it from where you stand. And that's wonderful and very helpful. Of course, I could just be a freak of nature. It's very possible. But I still like to give people the benefit of the doubt and believe that, uh, like when I did my internship at the Department of Education, I came in with all of my prejudices on high alert, assuming that the the people who worked at the Department of Education were not the best and the brightest, that they were office drones who were, you know, just getting their government paycheck so that they could get their government pension and suck the rest of us dry, and that the Department of Education was just the biggest farce in the world. But I wanted to do an internship there so that I would know. And I spent my summer there. It was the summer of... It was the summer of 1998. I was blown away, completely flattened, blown away. Wonderful people, still in touch with them. Wonderful people doing amazing, wonderful things. Multiracial, multilingual. A lot of the work that we did, we were doing for First Nation, Native American uh, reservation schools compiling best practices and getting information out to the schools and finding grant money to try and get technology 
and a power grid and internet access out to people who needed it. People who, oh, by the way, still need it because... Uh, either way, soapbox, over. Arthur is seeing negative, vindictive, nasty motives where there aren't any. And it says everything about Arthur and nothing about Millicent and Helen, except, wow, are they unlucky. We are going to see more of that polarization of Arthur going his direction and Helen being pushed like repellent magnets, being pushed in the opposite direction. We will see more of that before we stop seeing that. From, I believe from this point on, any time we get any kind of a religious statement from Helen, it is pretty much Anne Bronte's words coming out of her mouth. It has been mostly up until now. Certainly anytime she makes kind of a pronouncement of her philosophy or, or thinking like this whole idea that degradation of, of mind, body, and spirit is something that is felt deeply by the people who you are closest to and that it is impossible not to be dragged some distance down by it yourself, no matter how good you are. And that's why you have to work so hard to pull yourself the other way. Uh, so we are going to see more of that before, before we don't. And I promise it has a happy ending. We just aren't there yet. All right. I'm going to leave you now. You have a great week until I see you again. If you want to listen to something that is fun, mystery, totally seems very modern, even though it was written like 100 years ago, well, not 80 years ago, uh, The Swimming Pool by Mary Roberts Reinhardt. Really fun. Thank you, Jennifer Gordon. Uh, and Anne Blanton. I think you also read that. All right. I'm out of here. I have to go to work. I will talk to you soon. Take care. Have a great one. Wear a mask. Be safe. Wash your hands. <laughs> All right. Bye. If you like what you heard today, please leave a review over at iTunes. Join us on Facebook. Meet up with the knitters on Craftlet's Corner of Ravelry. Stay in the know on Instagram or add your name to our mailing list, which I promise will never spam you. In fact, you probably want to buy a lottery ticket on any day that you get a message from the Craftlet mailing list because that'll be a special day. And remember, if your hands are too busy to pick up a book, at least you can turn one on.